Let me talk about how the design of the new input system handles action maps and player management. There's a lot of things that we want to solve. First of all, we want input from different devices. There's keyboard, mouse, gamepads, and many other types of devices. Second of all, we want to support different control schemes. So one control scheme might be keyboard and mouse, uh, and the game might say like press space to jump. Uh, and another control scheme might be gamepad, where in the same game, uh, if you use a gamepad, it says press A to jump. Then there's different states of input. So you might have player actions, buttons for moving, jumping, fire, stuff like that. Then you might have a state where the player has entered a vehicle, and now the input is about uh, acceleration, braking, and moving around uh, that way, uh, and that's a different, like different buttons and, and different things that that the buttons do. Uh, then you, uh, in the game, you might uh, go into a menu, and now the left thumbstick or the arrow keys, now they're about navigating the menu and selecting buttons, uh, going back, and things like that. And at the same time, you might have debug actions while you're debugging the game, buttons for detaching the camera, spawning extra enemies, or things like that. So depending on the current context of the game, uh, there can be different sets of actions that are uh, relevant. Um, and those different uh, sets of actions, they can map to the same buttons or, or keys or uh, other inputs. And some of these sets of actions are mutually exclusive, but others are not. So for example, you might have your player or vehicle actions running, but at the same time, the debug actions are also active. Another thing we want to solve is handling multiple players. So your game might support a uh, single player, uh, and it might support local multiplayer, uh, where there's multiple people, uh, giving input to the same computer, for example, using multiple gamepads. And your game might support both. Maybe it has a single player mode and a local multiplayer mode. And you want to share the same code and the same prefabs. You, you want as much as possible to be shared uh, for both the single player mode and the local multiplayer mode uh, without needing any changes, or at least as, as, as little as possible. We also need to be aware of how people use Unity specifically. People use Unity and they often get things from the asset store. So you might have a player control script uh, that you got from the asset store from some essential player package. Uh, and this is really good for controlling a player that's walking and running around. Then you might have a vehicle control script that's from a different asset store package, ultimate vehicle package. And this one is made by a different publisher, and it's really good for controlling vehicles. Now, these different input handling scripts from different sources, they should all be possible to use together. And this is despite the fact that they were not designed to be used together. Currently in Unity, I mean, it's, uh, it's really bad if you're trying to, to get different packages that all rely on input to get them to work together. It's... It's a mess, uh, and this is something we really want to work really smoothly uh, with the new system. We need to design the system to solve all of these, and at the same time, uh, this is a tricky part because all these different constraints, they are not completely separate and orthogonal. They all touch upon similar things that makes it tricky to design something that solves all of the constraints. But let's have a look. So first of all, we have a concept called action maps in the new system. This is also something that's used in some other engines. So in an action map, you specify different actions. It could be a jump action or an action for moving horizontally. An action can also be like a continuous value, like the, the input from a thumbstick. Uh, it doesn't have to be a discrete event. Then you'd uh, specify different control schemes. Maybe you have a keyboard and mouse control scheme, and a gamepad control scheme. And for each action, you specify what that action maps to for each control scheme. So the jump action might map to space for keyboard and mouse, and to button A for the gamepad, and so on. 
So why do we have this concept of explicit control schemes? For example, in the current input system, you can specify the, the horizontal axis. It gets input from the arrow keys on the keyboard and from the left uh, thumbstick, and it, it can get input from all kinds of different things, but it's not specified like what belongs to what control scheme. And why is that not good enough? Well, one reason is we want the game to be aware of which control scheme is currently in use. So if the player is using keyboard and mouse, we could show the message press space to jump, while if the player is using gamepad, we can display the message press A to jump. And uh, there's many uh, like prompts and tutorial text and things like that that benefit a lot from being able to show the correct instruction based on what the player is actually using. Another reason is that if you have a local multiplayer game, it's important that the game knows which control scheme is in use for a specific player. So for example, one player might use keyboard and mouse. If we didn't have the concept of control schemes, we might just see, well, there's only one keyboard attached to the computer, so since we need input from the keyboard, we cannot have any more player instances because there's not any more keyboards available. But when we have separate control schemes, we can know, okay, well, there's one keyboard and one mouse, and uh, this means we can have one player using the keyboard and mouse control scheme. But there's also this other control scheme, the gamepad control scheme, and there's two gamepads available, so we can have two players using the gamepad control scheme. Now, how do you get started using action maps? Let's uh, take it from the beginning in four simple steps. So first you create and set up an action map asset. This is a new asset type, you create it like any other asset, and then in the ins uh, inspector of the asset you set up the actions and the control schemes and the bindings like we just discussed before. Second step, add a player input component to your player avatar prefab. This is a new component that handles player input. And now you drag the action map asset into this component. The third step, this is for your script that handles player input. First, you need to have a public variable uh, of type player input, so it can reference the player input component. You also need a variable for uh, the specific action map that you're using. So each action map in Unity automatically creates a corresponding uh, class. So if you had an uh, action map called first person controls, there's now a first person controls class and you can have a variable of this type. Then in the start method, you can get the first person controls object from the player input component. And now you can just access the different actions from the action map input called first person controls. So for example, the fire action, you can use by uh, writing dot fire, and then you can get the different uh, properties for this action, like is it held down now? Was it just pressed down? Was it just released? And things like that. And this fully supports IntelliSense. There's no string handling or anything. The first step is that you need to reference the player input in the script you just created. So you just drag the player input component and drag it into the player input field in your own script. And that's it. You're done. Now your player avatar gets input for single player games for now. And if the player uh, switches what input devices they're using, like if they first use mouse and keyboard, but then begin using the gamepad instead, the game automatically switches and shows corresponding uh, prompts and so on. If we want to go a bit more extended and use multiple action maps, let's have a look at how that works. So that might be your player actions, your vehicle actions, menu actions and debug actions, for example. So we have something called the action map stack. In the player input component, you can reference multiple action maps. And the action maps are added to the player input component in a stack. Now, while the game is running, events are sent through the stack from top to bottom. For each action map input, we look at, does this uh, actually use the event? So in this case, we have an event that corresponds to the B button being pressed down. And we first look at the debug actions. Do they use the event? No, then send it to the next one. The menu actions, do they use the event? No. The vehicle actions, do they use the event? 
Oh, they use the event. All right. If the action map input uses the event, it's not sent to the remaining action map inputs. So now the B button has been pressed uh, and the vehicle actions has registered that. And that means that scripts that are listening to the vehicle actions uh, can do something uh, correspondingly. It also means the B button press will not be sent to the uh, player actions, the next action map, even if the B button was also mapped in the player actions. This way, only one thing at a time reacts to a given input. Now, the action map inputs can be active or inactive. Inactive ones are always skipped. So in this case, the uh, menu actions are inactive. And for that reason, they get skipped. Action map inputs can also be set to block subsequent maps. This means that maps further down won't get the event no matter if it was used or not. So for example, the vehicle actions might have many of the same uh, buttons mapped as uh, player actions, but maybe not all of them. But when the vehicle action map is active, we never want any events to be sent to the player actions. So in this case, we can use this uh, block feature. The initial active and blocking state can be specified in the inspector. And at runtime, they can be changed by gameplay code. Now let's have a look at multiplayer setup. Player scripts and prefabs uh, can be the same in multiplayer setup as they can for single player. Now we just need some self-contained script uh, for handling players that want to join the game. Now in order to have this self-contained script, either some coding is required or the user might use one of a, a provided set of generic scripts that does it. The key to multiplayer setup is something called player handles. Each player input component contains a player handle object that uniquely identifies a player. And with player, I don't mean player avatar, I mean the players playing the game. Player handles also keep track of which input devices a player can get input from. So one player handle might get input from keyboard and mouse, another might get input from one gamepad, and a third might get input from a different gamepad. Player handles can be global or non-global. Global player handles listens to all unassigned devices. A non-global player handle only listens to devices specifically assigned to it. Global player handles can be used for single player games. This just means that the single player uh, game uh, will listen to all the devices. So if the player switches from using one device to another, the game will automatically switch and everything will continue automatically. Global player handles can also be used for local multiplayer managers that need to listen to potential new players. In this case, the player handle represents potential players rather than a specific player. And in this case, the global player handle can just be created directly without any game object or player input component having to be present. So let's have a look at an example of a multiplayer setup. The first thing is to create a global player handle that listens to a join action on all devices. When a join action occurs, we can get the control scheme and the associated devices that were used for the action. So if somebody presses a key uh, on the keyboard or the mouse, that is the join key, then we know that this was done with a specific control scheme, the keyboard and mouse control scheme, for example, and we can get that control scheme and the keyboard and mouse devices that are associated with it. So even if the key was pressed only on the keyboard, we will get both the keyboard and a mouse because they're part of the same control scheme. Now create a non-global player handle and assign those devices to it. When appropriate, maybe after the player has customized a player avatar, something like that, instantiate a player avatar prefab and assign the player handle to its player input component. So we instantiate the prefab, the prefab has a player input component, and we assign the player handle to the player input component. More players can join as long as there's more compatible devices left. So if the join action is pressed 
on uh, some device and it's part of a control scheme. Again, we can assign the device from that control scheme to a new player handle, instantiate a prefab and assign the player handle to the player input component on the prefab. Okay, but now we have player input and we have player handles. Why do we have two different objects to resend a player instead of just one? To answer that question, let's have a look at some example setups. So say we have two different players, player one and player two, and they each have two different scripts that handle input. One script handles player movement and another script handles vehicle movement. So how does each script know which devices to get input from? Each script cannot just request a device independently without knowing what the others are doing. The vehicle movement on player one might request something and get keyboard and mouse. The player movement might get a gamepad. And now you, you have to use completely different devices when you're in different modes of the game. That doesn't make any sense. So we need something different. Instead, each script can reference a common player input component which knows which devices the player has assigned. Then each of the input handling scripts, the vehicle movement and the player movement, they just reference the same player input and get consistent uh, inputs from devices that way. So why do we also have the player handles? So let's have a look at the lifetime of a player handle. The player handle might initially be created by a multiplayer manager. This is before any player avatar game object even exists. Maybe the player chooses which avatar to spawn as. Should it be a warrior, a rogue, or maybe a wizard? The chosen avatar is instantiated, and the player handle is assigned to the player input component on that prefab instance. Later, the player might want to switch to a different avatar. The current avatar is destroyed, but a reference is kept to the player handle. Now the new avatar is instantiated and the player handle is assigned to it. To sum up, player input components are there so multiple scripts can get a reference to the same player and the associated devices. The component is tied to a specific game object, for example, an avatar prefab. Now the player handles are there to keep the data that exists before and after specific game objects instances. They can be transferred from one player input component to another. You might say player avatars may come and go, but player handles are forever. Now, that was my little presentation of how the design of the new input system, we try to solve all these different constraints at the same time. Thank you for watching.